Kevin, thank you so much for agreeing to talk us around these and kind of what they represent, which we'll get to in a bit. Let's start with the cars that we have here, though, because they are, in their own right, pretty extraordinary things. They are, the first thing to sort of say is probably the, the seating layout. Let's start with that before we get into the, the engineering underneath them, because what made you want to go with this particular seating layout? Well, I mean, you know, thinking about hypercars, you think about extreme performance. And if you really want to be in the optimal driving position, you want to be in the center of, of the vehicle, and you also want to optimize aero. So, uh, and the third thing is, you also want to have something that emotionally is cool and gripping in terms of a look and a configuration. And you know, I looked and said, okay, I want to have a driver in a center seating position, and then I want to have jet fighter type seating because that minimizes the frontal surface area of the vehicle for mm -hmm. maximum aero efficiency. And that configuration to me was you know, the best form for driving and the emo most emotional configuration that you could be in for performance driving. And once you've, once you've got across the relatively wide sill, which is always the thing about a central driving position that's probably the most awkward thing, but once you're in there, it's just, it's a fantastic feeling of sort of being cocooned in this beautiful sort of airy cockpit, isn't it? Sure, and, and you know, you, you sat in the vehicle, so you know that sitting in it, you actually have lots of room, and mm. in the rear, there's even more room than the front seat, and you have this panoramic view, so, you know, that configuration, once you get in, you know, that's a very tight, high performance driving position that's also from an experience standpoint, you know, something that's very uh, emotional. You feel like you're in a jet fighter. Absolutely. Now, talking of high performance, let's talk about the drivetrain of this car sure. because we have got, we've got an internal combustion engine sure. at the rear and we've got electric motors, two of them mm -hmm. up at the front. Tell us a bit about that. Sure, so if you're really looking for ultimate track performance, you need to put power to the ground, right? And putting more horsepower into two wheels is gonna have a limit, right? You're, you're going to be limited by the traction you can get. So Even you want to be- Even if you've got a, big three, two, five section cup twos on it. Sure. I mean, we, it's kind of... You know, this is a 950 horsepower mid-engine V8. Uh, but in order to get ultimate track performance and accelerate out of a corner or accelerate from a low speed quickly, uh, you want to have traction also through the front wheels. Mm -hmm. So we set it up as a strong hybrid. Uh, there's an electric motor, two electric motors in the front. Each is 150 uh, horsepower. Uh, and that allows us to, coming out of a corner, you know, with torque vectoring, put uh, traction through all four wheels for a total uh, uh, power output of 1,250 horsepower. But if you really want to get, you know, ultimately, you know, one or two seconds, uh, uh, you know, off of a lap time, you re and, and you want to have crazy acceleration like this car has, you know, zero to 100 kilometers an hour or zero to 400 kilometers an hour and back, you need an all-wheel drive uh, vehicle. Uh, which is what we put together. And obviously we, we did it in a way that uh, uh, focuses on power density of the powertrain itself and power to weight. And let's, a couple of things there. Sure. So the uh, performance figures themselves, 0.62 and 1.9 seconds, is that Yeah, right? zero, zero to 100 kilometers an hour in 1.9 seconds. And wow zero to 400 kilometers an hour and back to zero in 29 seconds. And you know, for Americans like myself who grew up street racing and drag racing, quarter mile in yeah. 8.1 seconds. Wow. Um, and then the next thing is, is weight, because obviously right. as soon as you start mentioning electric motors mm -hmm. and batteries that go with them, that sort mm -hmm. of thing, people think this is gonna weigh quite a lot, but it doesn't, does it? It doesn't, and uh, I'll tell you why. The, Part of it is that we're using two very lightweight uh, micro battery packs. So uh, the battery pack that, that powers each of the electric motors up front is two kilowatts. So it's, Which is, is tiny. I mean, that it, sounds like nothing really to kind of to produce. 
It, it is, but what we're doing is we have a rear uh, generator motor that uh, is continuously recharging those batteries along with the regenerative uh, braking from the electric motors themselves. And that rear generator is run by the, the crank of the internal combustion engine, you know, which also acts as the starter for the, the uh, internal combustion engine. But that allows us to have very small packs, be able to use that power when it's needed coming out of a corner or accelerating the vehicle. And then obviously the you know, mid-engine uh, you know, dual turbo V8 takes over at that point. Uh, but what that allows you to do is have uh, a very light uh, vehicle uh, with a lot of power going through all four wheels by minimizing the pack size and maximizing the efficiency of the vehicle by only using that front wheel drive when it's needed yeah. uh, and recharging the battery system through that rear generator. Absolutely. Let's walk around to sure. this car because we've got the rear deck open here. So the engine is, is actually small, it's, it's 2.9 2 liters. 2.88 liter, yes. Um, which for, you know, given, you say, very power dense, given the amount yes. of horsepower it's putting out, what will it rev to? Uh, I mean, the red line's 11,000, but, you know, at its peak power, which is around 950 horsepower, uh, you're peaking at around 10,500 RPM. <laughs> but at, even at that, the, the motor is screaming. I mean, it, it, this is a very, emotional uh, vehicle when yeah. you're in it. When you're in that central driving position, all four wheels are connecting and you have the scream. It's, it's like an early 2000s F1 car, <laughs> back when they had the V8s yeah. and they were revving into the teens. Yeah, That's how you feel. And, and that, quite frankly, is what I was trying to capture from an emotion standpoint. That's what I enjoy. Absolutely. Now we've got, um also under here, a bit of an idea of some of what's going on underneath the skin of this, because sure. that's where this car gets, I think, arguably even more interesting. Sure. We'll mention the exhaust here as well, because I gather that splits sure. um, cross flames out of the back, which is not for show, it's just because it's, it's sufficient, but it's also, let's face it, very, very cool. Well, yeah, it, it, had, yeah. <laughs> it had the happy coincidence that it is more uh, efficient, but it, it is very cool to, to think that, uh, you know, in, in my own mind, I, I was looking and thinking, okay, you know, you have like X-Men and now you can create a car that's like an X-Beast that's putting out an, an X-Flame in the back. But, you know, th that was the happy coincidence of something very cool coming together with something that's actually the most efficient way to, uh, to structure the exhaust. Um, 3D printing, we can see a little bit of it sure. in, in here, and that's, that's what's going on underneath right. this car mm -hmm. in terms of some of the extraordinary uh, shapes that you know, can be now generated um, by, by computers. Sure. Um, and this car, that sort of brings us on to what this car represents all these cars sure. represent because this is this is not just about producing mm -hmm. a wow factor car it mm -hmm. is to get people sort of to, to trigger people for you as development but also to trigger people into the idea of what this mm -hmm. can represent in terms of the manufacturing and production so could you sure. explain a little bit more about some of that please so yes Henry. so the, these vehicles literally up until now could not have been created I mean, what we've done is to take a combination of computational engineering using high performance uh, computing, supercomputing, to generate a fully engineered structure using materials that we've invented and designed for specific performance use and for printing, and having the machine take and select those materials out of a database and then put material only where it's needed against the engineering requirements. And once you take that computationally engineered uh, data that's done, you then send it to a printer uh, with a spec that we have using our materials and our software. You then generate that structure and then that structure with very high precision using a laser camera uh, optic system uh, is assembled. And the machine doesn't care if you're building one type of structure or another. 
It's like a, a Mac desktop publishing system, not caring whether you're publishing a Bible or you're publishing a comic book. Right? It can switch from one uh, to the other. And then once that's printed, having the design uh, uh, for assembly features actually built into the structure so you can then take that structure and in an automated way uh, assemble it. And, and we use a set of adhesives that we've developed and patented to bring all of the multiple materials for a structure together in an automated way. So it's design, print, assemble in a modular way that's non-design specific, meaning you're not having to retool something and uh, machine hardened steel blanks and then stamp out pieces of the same gauge alloy, steel, or aluminum. All of that goes away. The fixturing for assembly goes away and you have a system that's very much like uh, an industrial grade Mac desktop publishing system. Imagine a vehicle, imagine a performance requirement, imagine a structure, generate it, print it, uh, and assemble it. Kevin, it sounds absolutely fascinating. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Enjoyed it.